Paul Simon is joining us. Paul Simon? Paul Simon. Paul Simon. People used to say, oh, you have your finger on the pulse. No, I don't have my finger on the pulse. I just have my finger out there. And the pulse is running under. All right. Welcome to Rock Docs, a podcast about music documentaries brought to you by Treble Media, treblezine.com. Although they are uh, a website, so I don't know if that counts as a zine. So we may be we may be guilty of false advertising all this time, but nonetheless, uh, check them out because that's that's good music writing right there. If you like music and writing, they combine the two things um, and in a way that is uh, good. So check Expertly. them out. Expertly, Expertly. well done. Yeah. And that's my co-host, Andrew Keats. And um, yeah, we are joined by uh, once again uh, Dan Jasper. Uh, who Hello. was, uh, yeah, hi, Dan, um, <laughs> who you may have uh, enjoyed or at least listened to or uh, <laughs> heard, <laughs> or heard, been aware of our uh, podcast about the Rolling Stones documentary Crossfire Hurricane. And now Dan is, uh, Dan's back with another uh, another classic rocker. But uh, Two-timer club. Thanks, guys. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about the film in Restless Dreams, the music of Paul Simon, uh, a 2023 film, although really it seems like everybody saw it this year, uh, directed by Alex Gibney, uh, who you may know from, um, well, he did the Frank Sinatra uh, rock doc, right. which was, uh, you know, kind of a, you know, an, a, an authorized kind of thing. So didn't More of a crooner it. doc. More of a crooner doc. But, yeah, <laughs> croon, yeah, crooner docs <laughs> is our other podcast, which is so popular. People love crooner uh-huh. docs. Um, but uh, he directed that. But he's also known for uh, directing the Enron documentary and oh, you know a bunch of Going Clear Scienti- Scientology. Scientology. Um, any Scientologist uh, Holmes. Scientologist fans or fans of the Theranos product who still believe yeah. it's going to work out, you might just <laughs> just get off now. This is holding on to my stock. Yeah. They weren't wrong. They were early. <laughs> it's gonna, yeah, exactly. Um, I I gave blood to them today, so I'm just waiting for all my diseases to be cured. Um, okay, with the um. Anyway, so uh, yeah, it's available on um, MGM Plus, which is a uh, streaming service that everybody has. So, yes. <laughs> or, or, or as David said, <laughs> MGM has a streaming service. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So, Listen, um, whatever it, works. It's a uh, streaming service that uh, I now am subscribed to for a month. But um, there's some good stuff on there, I will say. So check it out. Uh, shout out to MGM Plus. <laughs> anyway, I was I was surprised. I just sort of give me is just like become the documentarian of the last you know five or ten yeah. years right i was surprised digging back into his his um his career that he just hasn't done more in the in the music space you know the 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 sinatra is really the thing that stands out he doesn't ha- he doesn't have like an, an episode of a docu-series about a musician there's just not a lot of uh of rock doc in there i think he's good at it yeah. I liked I liked the Sinatra one. I don't know if you guys did an episode on it, but that that was a good documentary. I thought as well. No, we haven't uh, done it, and I liked that one because it had the, uh, it kind of it kind of um, was built around that um, that kind of retirement concert that he did in the early seventies, right. and it, yeah. it was a cool kind of way to to frame it. And um, yeah, um, if you scroll through, he's like executive produced some other yeah. rock docs and. Janis Joplin, one famously um, a, a, bi- a big fan, um, and um, a few others. So he's just like really got he's he's really got the uh, the documentary thing on lock. Um, but I guess uh, you know the Bucks are in the uh, doing the occasional authorized rock doc of this sort, <laughs> and that's yeah. what we got. So um, was anyway. this authorized? I couldn't tell. Yeah, I think it's quite <laughs> author. It's extremely authorized. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so, okay. So, um, I don't know. I mean, every none of us like ever probably knew a time in life where there wasn't a Paul Simon. Um, but like, do you have early memories of getting into Paul Simon or, or when he came into your life, Dan? Um, really only became aware of him when they did the Central Park show. Okay. Hadn't really, you know, I kind of knew some of their tunes just like in the ether, but I was, you know, still not. I was like, let's see, what would that have been? 81? I was, whatever, eight years old. So I was a boy. But 
the only living boy in New Just York. A, I, I, guess, I, was, I, was, I was hard. Waiting, <laughs> giving you the space for trying that. Trying not to. <laughs> uh, but um, but no, that that's when he popped in. So. I was in love with that concert. Like I love that music. Like it just hit me kind of all at once. The songs that I knew, the songs I didn't know and was all about that even, even at the young age and then just kind of grew into, you know, what the career was and all the little beats and the things that you learn about someone, if you're interested and yeah, you're right. His music was always there. It was always kind of a, a high quality thing. It was like a premium sound. He always sounds great. I mean, we'll get into, into his his attributes but yeah i i was always a fan from the first time i heard him and i don't think it's ever really abated in terms of of just liking his music what about you guys andy yeah i'd say i have a i have a a, a pretty mundane version you know same thing i i i remember you know simon and garfunkel were certainly like oldies but goodies radio in my in my family's totally. house um that was like my parents were into that music and it was it was on all the time um and then you know paul simon solo stuff i got into when i was pretty young i don't know maybe early high school something like that uh i will say i remember it being like incredibly common like a the, maybe the most common thing to listen to in the mm-hmm. college dorm my freshman year it was mm-hmm. like what ev- everyone listened to at um you know like a a, a barbecue or like you know a, a pre pre-game a couple beers or something like that it was goes uh, down easy yeah Paul Simon and goes down easy especially yeah. among a bunch of uh predominantly white liberal arts college students in in uh <laughs> in in 2002 there was a lot of a lot of Paul Simon to, to, to be listened to at the time predominantly white liberal arts students is clearly his demographic <laughs> yes it was just there's there's just cha- changing between that and the talking heads basically Yes, uh, I yeah. I would guess that he has one African American fan, and that person appears in this movie. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure there's you know, I'm sure there's fans, but uh, you know that he's 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 not known for the diversity of his audience. I um, I'm sure I was aware of Paul Simon, but I was in elementary school when Graceland came out, and it was like legally required to be in the car if you were driving carpool. Like, yeah. you know, there was like, I'm sure there was an entire year where like Stacy Rothman <laughs> drove the carpool and like diamonds on the soles of her shoes was, was rocking <laughs> to and from, uh, Degano country school. So, um, <laughs> there's no, uh, that's definitely my deepest, um, you know, yeah. early memory. Um, yeah. and also I went to like a, a hippie free range elementary school and they would have like, uh, they would, they would call it circle in the beginning at uh, the beginning of the day that we'd all sit around and one of the teachers would bust out an acoustic guitar and, and sing like you know 60s uh, era folk songs um and um like feeling groovy was definitely one of them probably right. sounds of silence like you know the the, yeah. the paul simon catalog was deep in there with the circle game and and, and all that kind of stuff so wow. um so yeah so that's uh that's early stuff and yeah i just kind of followed him along i did see uh the paul simon bob dylan uh tour uh, here in san diego in uh, mm. in 1999 uh bob opened and paul closed that show and they did sing a few tunes together in the middle um Mm. you know i was probably the only person in the entire amphitheater who was more amped for bob than paul but i was still a paul simon fan i was excited to see it but um yeah you know like most of the people there were like okay when is this old dude gonna be done so we can you know (laughs) when's this old dude gonna be done so (laughs) So we can can get to to paul simon (laughs) (laughs) right well <laughs> Which was the old dude? Wait a minute. Right, yeah. <laughs> what is this old Jew gonna wrap it up to so the other old Jew? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, they should have called That's that funny. old Jews, like you know, yeah. old friends, old Jews. Come on, why yeah. didn't they call it that? Come on. Yeah. They literally, literally left that one sitting on the table. Um. Anyway, so um, yeah. That's uh, that's my my Paul Simon journey. Yeah. Um. But I tell you, I think his, you know, the legacy stuff obviously is a big part of a doc like this, especially. But I found you know, going from introduction to getting to know his music that it rewards. He's one of those artists where, like we say, it goes down easy. He can be on in the background. You don't have to think a lot to enjoy it, but it rewards learning the lyrics. It rewards understanding how the musicality, it rewards, you know, paying attention and kind of um, 
realizing that, oh, that's a surprising thing that he just did there. He, right. he didn't have to do that, but it works so great. How do you come Re- up with, you know, reading so the liner notes, who the who the musicians on the tracks are and then, Truly. you know, learning a little bit about those guys. You know, it's, it, it, it does have a, a, a depth to offer beyond it does. what seems and, to be pretty sim- simple. Yeah. So it rewards that. Right. He's, it's not just like an uh, uh, what's the easy listening track, you know. Right. He's 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 got his he's got his dose of genius in there too. Yeah, I mean he's definitely like among the you know well-known classic rock people. One of the people that most approaches music as a composer. And I mm-hmm. guess that sounds pretentious and that's fine because it's, you know, it it the music kind of has that element, but um you know, somebody like a Joni Mitchell, uh, you know, even Prince, like there's some people that like you could see them in a different time and place, like composing a symphony or whatever was the thing of the time. And mm-hmm. they have that ability and skill and knowledge and, and depth and ability and, you know, just like doing chords and th- and progressions in a completely different way from anybody else. And also, I mean, I guess Steely Dan in a way is like that, although a little bit more from a jazz perspective. But, um, you know, there, there's they're kind of few and far between in terms of people that are really commercially successful and also able to, you know, have that kind of thing where like you can you know geek out on it musically and or the lyrics also you know some some people have one or the other you know but um listen i'll I'll cop to it i i uh, i'm i'm a i'm a huge fan it's why i wanted to you know talk about it with you guys um and you know getting something like this i mean this is the god treatment right you know you've got alex gibney working on it you're getting the two-parter you got um, MGM Plus. You probably were you probably were hoping for Netflix, but <laughs> but you're you're on MGM Plus. Um, but uh, but no, I, I I consider it like like worthy of its subject. You know, it's it's it, obviously we we're joking about it being authorized. It clearly takes its subject, you know, as seriously as that subject wishes to be taken. Um, but listen, I say, you know, you've earned it when when, when you've got his career. Um, and you know it starts with with first of all I love they do a good job though they don't really pull any punches like it was ugly with Artie <laughs> yeah. towards the end you know towards the end and the extended end it was like they were just and I what I love what I love about that we can get into that part of it yeah, 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 yeah we, we can get into know. whatever um is you know whether it's McCartney and Lennon or any 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 duo any collaborative artistic duo, the f- if they've been friends since 11 years of age, right. As, as the, those two examples are, um, or whatever it is that like, that's your starting point for understanding everything else. Like if you see these guys fighting or bickering or getting on each other's nerves or saying something really nasty towards the other, it's like, they've been friends since sixth grade. Right. Yeah. It's not like two adults <laughs> who right. meet up as adults and are like bickering with each other and kind of have to put up with it. It's like if, if it's your sixth grade friend, there's nothing that's really going to break that bond as nasty as it gets and as ugly as the relationship and the breakup and all that. Um, but to me, that that helps you understand everything else. Yeah, the 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 Simon and Garfunkel breakup and, and relationship is handled interestingly here because I. I don't think they actually really get at the the real source of 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 the breakup. You know, like mm-hmm. I be- think they're just telling telling fairy tales a little bit. Well, I I believe that the time that it ended was when Art went to go film Catch Twenty Two, like okay. chronologically. I, I have You're no saying, doubt, but that- there's another cause though. Yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> like I, I like. Oh, it was a scheduling issue, and they were just like, "Forget about, <laughs> forget about this, this entire career that we've had. We can't uh-huh. get past this this calendar snafu." Like, I don't, okay. I don't, I don't buy that. I think, and I think if you like read about other things that Paul has said and and Art had said, they have that sort of friendship that you have when you with somebody you've known your whole life, which which is to say, like, you may not necessarily even like them that much. <laughs> right. you, you know, you've just known yeah. them forever, and at a certain point, like. You just get sick and tired of dealing with it, and you reach into a point in your adult life where you're like, "This was not a blood oath. We, we did not <laughs> right. decide to right. do this for our whole life. We Pettiness can, can win. Yeah, we can just <laughs> go the other way." And right. like, 
I don't know. I just think that that is that's the subtext I pick up on. When but I, I think this. I think the story they tell though yeah. the 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 official version yeah. isn't incompatible with what you're saying. Yeah, I think it sure. can, both can be both can I be think, fully true. Yeah, that's true. And in know? the same way, like those sorts of lifetime friendships when they do end, you'll sometimes hear like, "Well, what was the inciting event?" And you're like, "Wait." You ended a friendship that you've been <laughs> had your entire history. life because of that. <laughs> like it doesn't make sense, right? And, right. And but if you if you watch more. if you watch something like Get Back, yeah. right? Yeah, you're seeing and and I haven't seen Let It Be, so maybe some of it's in there. Although I understand it's pretty whitewashed. That um, it, it's the same kind of thing. Like the, like when you're like, oh, that's George Harrison, or you know, look at them. They're 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 bickering or they're bantering or they're making jokes. Like, yeah, they've been friends since they were 15 years old. Like, mm-hmm. and they, you know, started in Hamburg. Like, the history is so thick with these guys. There is, this is blood, you know, with, with you know, to, to, to the extent that there's a partnership. And um, they're that first. Mm-hmm. And they can fight about money and Ellen Klein and the, you know, Apple going broke and all, everything else. But, and I just see a big parallel with, with this kind of thing. And yeah, eventually it ruptures. Eventually it breaks and does not completely repair. But that one little aside where he told Artie he wasn't, you know, I'm not going to continue with the tour or whatever else, but I'm getting married this week. Do you, you, you want to come, come to the, the wedding? wedding? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's kind of it in a nutshell, right? Yeah, totally. Totally. I think, yeah. I mean, cause I, I've apparently in, you know, other things that, that have been written about Paul Simon, he has said that he was really nervous when they were young, that because art was tall, the audience would all assume that he must have written all the songs. <laughs> sure. That's, we know that's how it works. And that he like, and, uh. and, and that part of the chip on his shoulder in, in, in that, like a lot of people in the sixties and seventies just thought he was hard to deal with was he said that he thought people acted like they could get one over on him because he was short. And <laughs> I do wish they had talked about that. And it's like, <laughs> that's it's, great. I believe it. Yeah. And like, it's, it's funny because th- there is, yeah, again, there's like little breadcrumbs through this movie about like that he had this reputation as being kind of a kind of a, a tough guy to work with, and and sometimes relationships didn't last that long. But they don't really delve into it that much. No, that's the authorized part. Yeah, that that's the no. I mean, they don't <laughs> even way. they don't even <laughs> discuss really. I mean, his first girlfriend is mentioned, Kathy, because of the relationship of the song, basically, yeah. and his first wife is briefly mentioned. Mm-hmm. And his, I mean, Carrie Fisher obviously plays her role, but his, you know, his, um, you know, when he wasn't recording in the seventies, tons of huge hit Grammy winning albums, he had an active dating life. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, as well, he should say, well, yeah, <laughs> one, one might say he overachieved from time to time. <laughs> and that's, um, you know, that's not really uh, a, a part of the film. You know, it's not. I mean, they they call it, you know, uh, in Restless Dreams, uh, the music of Paul Simon. I think that's, you know, because he probably wanted to to focus more on music than on, you know, some. Yeah. I mean, not that there's anything salacious about the fact that any, I don't know, famous actresses. Like, there's no yeah. word about him being a bad guy. It's just he, no. you know, went no, out on he, some dates to Studio Fifty Four with whoever, you know. But but what Andrew said about like, you know. You get that you get a sense of the chip on the shoulder, but they never discuss the chip. You know, it's right. the it's the elephant in the room in a way, right? Because uh, I always thought this guy's a colossal asshole. Yes, yeah. And he carries himself that way. And and there's a few things. He's one of those guys. First of all, when he talk, he's really not afraid of silence, which no. lends itself to that kind of interpretation of, you know, you're going to pay attention to me, or I'm going to hold your attention in this way. You know, there's a lot that can be inferred when someone talks like he does, which is very deliberately. And I think he's, you know, it's maybe some of that, but he's also just a thoughtful guy. He doesn't just like to ramble or chit chat. He kind of likes to consider what he says. So, okay. Mm-hmm. But, but, um, you know, you combine that with, with Artie who like these two guys are just, they're just like at each other, like they're just ready to piss each other. <laughs> First of all, Artie dresses like, <laughs> Every time he's in an outfit, he looks like he's dressing to piss someone off. Like he's trying to piss you off with how he's dressed. At every stage of his career, I think I've noticed that. So it's like these two guys just have these personality that 
don't meld anywhere close to how wonderfully their voices meld. <laughs> They're yeah. totally at odds, but whatever, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it, you can make up a lot for it with, with how great the music is. Right. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, there's like the, um, there's one part they, they highlight and zoom in on a, a Rolling Stone article where Paul Simon said, well, when we were younger, we used to say that I wrote the songs and already arranged them. And obviously that was a myth. Right? <laughs> right, exactly. And like, and it's like, it's in the movie, but they didn't even like, there's ample use of narration in this movie. Like yeah. when they've wanted yeah. to get something into, into it officially, they, they had, they find a way, but here it's just like, let's just, let's just, uh, it'll, it'll be there if somebody wants to read it, but we don't we, <laughs> endlessly digging at each other. Yeah. And it's obviously, you know, it's from Paul's point of view, but they don't shy away from a lot of these quotes from Artie just right. kind of punching back. And you just yeah. go, look, these two guys just had this thing and it, it went the way that it went. Right. But I just love that. I love that they didn't, for all the, for all the authorized elements, I, I, I do think that they allowed Artie his say. Yeah, I think they did. I think they you did. Know, yeah, I think they were fair about getting it. Getting in the way. And it's yeah, not, I don't think Paul not, Sim- Simon comes a, a, away uh, out of this as like the the one who clearly looks good and had his <laughs> as his perspective. No, no, no. no. That's, that's, <laughs> right. that's true. Maybe he yeah. thinks that, but it, I yeah, don't yeah. think. Now, the flip side of Paul Simon being off, coming off like a pompous asshole is that um, he also, to his credit, has not been afraid to, um, you know, poke fun at himself. And yeah. Yeah. you know he, the really the only other substantial talking head in the movie other than Paul Simon, Edie Brickell, and then like some old audio of like you know Art Garfunkel and a little bit of Carrie Fisher is uh his BFF Lorne Michaels who's Lorne like Michaels is... the like almost like the narrator of the movie in a way yeah. you never see him the on second camera half for sure yeah. yeah you never see him on camera but he's there so much and um like apparently on Paul Simon's honeymoon with Carrie Fisher it was like Paul Carrie and Lorne <laughs> Like that's the picture you yeah. see, which they is like, like a little turn, weird. They like turn like, the movie over to Lauren Michaels for like forty minutes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, all well, right, you take the take the torch here. You got which is it. a weird choice, but he had a lot to add. Yeah, at the same did. time, and it didn't feel yeah like sort of uh, gratuitous or anything. Like I almost knew Paul Simon a little bit more, you know, when I was younger as like the Saturday Night Live guy because he was on <laughs> so much, and, so much, and it was good. And so and good. and okay, now I'm gonna lay my cards on the table here. Which is, um, when I went into this movie, I was hoping that we would get a little bit, we would see that Paul Simon come out. I knew, you know, in in terms of the older whatever. And I, at the end of this movie, which is three and a half hours long, so we're talking about like the length of like Lawrence of Arabia. (laughs) And I'm not saying that he's not, you know, his career doesn't deserve that. I'm saying that I am not convinced that he is a compelling protagonist for a movie that's this long. Hmm. Like I just kind of was like enough with this guy and, <laughs> and um, a little know, less of the weather veins yeah. and a little, you know, it, well, and, it had, and, you know, and, it spent a lot of time with I think the new album. Which, that's well, the thing. Yeah. We can we'll, be clear. We got, we'll get there. Let's get there in a second. <laughs> if you wanted to do a fan cut of this movie to cut it down to a tight two hours, uh, you know exactly what you would cut. It would not take long. All the stuff about the new album goes. And then, you have a two-hour movie that probably is a conventional rock doc about a guy who had a bunch of hits in the 60s, All 70s, fair. and 80s. And, All fair. And, All fair. And, and so you got- Andy kind of nailed this the other day as the Once Were Brothers problem because we did an episode on the documentary Once Were Brothers about the band, which was a Robbie Robertson joint. May he rest yeah. in peace. Love Robbie. <laughs> um, but he uh, frames that movie around a new song that he wrote called Once Were Brothers. And it sucks. <laughs> and it's <laughs> such a shame to, fr- yeah. I mean, there's other problems with the movie, but there, it's such a shame to like frame it around the like late period, real crappy Robbie Robertson song that nobody wants. And this is framed yeah. around his new I mean, it's album. not as bad as the Eagles with them having to like talk great about all their new uh, music. No, yeah, well, but, so, no, okay. no, so, that but was, that is compelling. But that is compelling movie. That is a com- the the no, the, the e- part two of the Eagles. The greatest like, movie of all time. <laughs> yeah, that's so, when that movie comes I'm with alive. You. I'm baby. With you all the way on that. <laughs> part two. My the, point is history that, of the Eagles. Part two. We haven't done an episode about the history of the Eagles uh, because we can't even. You have we, we can't. 
bring ourselves to approach this sacred text. It is so great <laughs> that I don't know that we could possibly do justice. We're we're working our way up, but I'm, anyway, I'm intimidated by. It. I'm here yeah, when I'm terrifying. here whenever you're whenever you're. It's, we may to need to have that. like a big group of I don't know. I something. mean, look, my my theory is that when all these guys remaster the old stuff and come out with some new album that you know was all the stuff they didn't want to record uh, over the last twenty years. It's like, hey, look, we just signed the new record contract. The royalty percentages are amazing. Yeah. Right. <laughs> We're going to push the hell out of this because yeah. whatever we sell, you know, a crappy album is going to make as much as our first two albums did combined right. with, that, with, that, with that horrible contract. So, you know, but I say give it to him. I give it to him. I give it all to him. I'll give him the two and a half, three and a half hours of the documentary. I'll give him the weather veins. I'll give him the the holding hands with Edie Brickell. I'll give it all to him. Cause I I I just think that this is I don't know. There there's just not a lot of guys who have his catalog and his the ability to um span a career like he does. I, I really Okay, that. but he's boring. That's the problem. I mean, right? <laughs> I'm just saying like he's boring today. He's boring he today. He was less boring when he was dating Carrie Fisher. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> there you go. That's the problem is the movie spends you know, yes, at least a, a third a of the running time on a boring old dude who seems kind of grumpy and does not show right. any evidence of having the sense of humor or insight no. or whatever that he had as a young person. And this is like, and I have like dutifully listened to every, and I'm just going to like, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just, I've dutifully, I dutifully, this is not one of the like classic rockers that I secretly hate that Andy loves to discover, uh, <laughs> you know, but cause there's a few of those and we, you know, but we, we all have them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I've dutifully listened to like every album that he's made in more or less my lifetime. And like, I just cannot get with any of anything he's done really? in the last 30 years. I just, oh, okay. well, that's you know, fine. yeah, no, I mean the first, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Essentially everything he did from 1960 to 1990. Great. And then yeah. it just falls off a cliff for me. And I'm, you know, I'm sure there's, like, I don't know. I don't even Joker think I've heard who are way into the, like the, album he did with brian eno or something i don't know but it just never i'm always like I, yeah man this is gonna be the one and it never connects i don't think i've heard anything he's recorded in the last 30 years. all right well then you there know, you go it, you're you're way ahead of me on that but uh but right, listen uh, to, for the the go, joker man yeah. mindset heads out there uh paul simon the, the song wristband that's a good one it's, it's a recent one okay <laughs> write that down wristband <laughs> yeah okay go to go to that like I like hearts and bones. I like all, and also I do want to say that I'm, this is uh, fits nowhere here. But Dan, I did want to say your shout out to the um, to the Central Park concert. I remember like when I was in college, that's what I listened to over and over again. I had like the CD yeah. to Central Park College, the Central Park concert, and I actually feel like in a way I kind of like that for those versions of the song almost better than the originals because I love that like early '80s keyboard sound that's going through it. It just mm. really like. I, I, you know, I think maybe there was a period of time where like that version of the song sounded kind of cheesy to people, but I think I just, I eat that up. Like the tasteful palette of that really does it for me. And, it's a legitimately uh, yeah. great uh, concert and album. Yeah. Y so. It just is, is, is definitive versions of a lot of their songs. Yeah. So anyway, mm -hmm. all right. I've laid my cards well, on the table that he's okay. a boring, cranky well, old dude. I'm, and I don't care what he has to say now. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to pick up some some of what you've just said maybe with a little less intensity um <laughs> impossible the, yeah <laughs> so I, I do think that everything about his writing uh so for anybody who hasn't seen the movie we begin the this film uh essentially with the revelation that paul simon in the beginning of 2019 started working on a new album the title of which came to him in a dream and he is putting it together now, and that is made more difficult by the fact that his, he is having hearing loss in one ear and voice problems for the first time in his career. And then the structure of the movie is we do we go back to the beginning and we get maybe 10 to 15 minutes of some chapter in his career and life, and then we bounce back to the creation of Seven Psalms, and then we go back to his you know, another chapter in his career chronologically from where we left off and then back to Psalms. I, as much as I dislike the the part where he's making the new album and I do dislike it, I, I really got very little out of it. The bigger problem is it absolutely kills any 
momentum that you're building in the part of his life that you want to, to watch about. Every time you start to have a good time going through Paul Simon's incredibly interesting career, you are yanked back to this incredible drag of a time in a log cabin with him just staring out at people like we don't often pensively. We don't even get much of him composing their pieces. He's mostly just thinking. Yeah. It is. You never shaking, hear any of the songs. Yeah. You never hear any of the songs. As far as I know, it's dirges. It's just. It's, it's just religious dirges. It's, it's yeah. Uh, and you get Winton Marsalis it, it, comes in as his like yeah. amanuensis or something like, like you know his fixer. His, yeah, like, his fixer. I actually I actually like the Winton Marsalis. Okay, all I right. Think, I, I like that. Yeah, uh, but it is the, the the structure is is throwing vegetables in the middle of your dessert. There's no question. <laughs> yes, it is totally it's like good for I, you. I have have to endure this. Like this is price of admission or something or like you know when yeah. they want to sell you a a timeshare. It's like come for the free steak you, dinner. Well, you know what it reminded <laughs> me of. This is, this is very similar. So uh, I don't know. Dan, if you uh, are familiar with the old Grey Boy All Stars, the acid jazz mm-hmm. group from the '90s, um, their uh, front man, Carl Denson, or w- one of their front men, Carl Denson, is a San Diego guy, and he plays a lot of concerts here in San Diego. His group these days is called Carl Denson's Tiny Universe, and mm-hmm. he booked a show last year that was Carl Denson's Tiny Universe does a tribute to the Beastie Boys, and they booked a much bigger venue than Carl Denson typically can book these days. And it's sold out. And I knew a lot of people who are not typically the types of folks I see at Carl Denson shows who packed this place, packed this relatively large venue. And then we got there and he played from the beginning an entire album of new material that no one's ever heard before. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and I like <sighs> I'm OK with it because I like Carl Denson's tiny universe right. quite a bit. But, but evidently were... Carl Denson doesn't like people. Yeah, but people in this crowd were very upset. People were really getting quite angry. And then they, you know, I'm so bummed I missed that. Read the room, Paul. Now, yeah. Carl Denson, we should read say, the room of ticket buyers. Yeah. Okay, Sorry. bringing it all together here. Yeah, Carl Denson is the touring saxophone player for. The Rolling, the Rolling Stones. Stones. That's so, yeah, yeah, he's the yeah. replacement wow. for Bobby Keys, and uh, I think they may have overlapped as well. But uh, so I don't know. Maybe cool. maybe he's like, I got that Rolling Stones touring money, and I don't really care about you know the people <laughs> in the, this club in Salada Beach or wherever it was. But there's um, something going on to do that. There's a there's an balls. active, but yeah, it was, there's it was, an active uh, issue. <laughs> like we're like thirty or forty minutes into this, the first part of this movie, and I was just like, dude, I can't believe he's doing. Like they are, he's pull, he's pulling the Carl D. <laughs> 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 he's been, yeah. Um, that's funny so, okay. so there's that whole there's that whole part here the, if there's another criticism i have this movie though is like some of the stuff that we do get in in the part of the career that everybody's really interested in isn't as compelling as i think the the filmmaker thinks it is like mm. do we need the entire grammy speech with uh with art and john lennon like the entire uninterrupted like <laughs> writ- written skit it's like yeah it's not that well delivered it wasn't that funny really it's they were all they were all on coke i think yeah john, <laughs> yeah. john like, is a rough shit <laughs> and yeah. like a very brief clip of it and it like it shows you just how famous he was he's palling around with john lennon He's like the point. he's like the most famous sure by all means. But do we need the entire uninterrupted clip of that <laughs> like not very funny They do that in a couple performance. Points. There's they a couple just, of those. Yeah. Just they could have cut a, a a bunch of things like that. Um but there but there's some things that that I think are are really either sweet or cool or interesting. First of all, when they get on the uh American bandstand and you guys probably know this, but you know, he says they don't really explain it, but I've heard him explain it when he gets on where you boys from. And he blurts out Macon, Georgia. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Does anyone know why he says Macon, Georgia? No. Why does he say Macon, Georgia? It's where little Richard's from. Oh, right. Yeah. These guys, all of them, including the Beatles. Yeah, sure. Just, and you guys, I know you guys did an episode right on, on his doc, right? Yes. Uh, Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's great. And that was purely why these guys all fucking idolized little Richard. And that's just something that's so contemporary. It's so right. it's like a historical document. Well, it's yeah. also in, around the that. time 
that you know young Bob Dylan shows up in New York and instead of saying like well I just you know left the University of Minnesota and came here yeah. he like tell, yeah. you know talks about how he was a uh, you know cowboy riding a boxcar and so that's right. also that's also kind of in the air when you way get, more interesting than Hibbings yeah right exactly totally. so so that was also in the air in terms of like in those days it was still like you could just make yourself whoever you wanted to be there was no you know it's record. just a little myth making nobody it's would just a- but the fu- yeah, Artie's reaction is hilarious. Where he's like, and "Where are you from?" He's like, "I'm from Queens." Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Way like, to go! Like you could have let Artie in on the bit, but I, apparently yeah. it just happened off the top of his head. I just and I just love that because it's very sweet and it's very real and it's like you know what were they sixteen or something? Yeah. So I love stuff like that. And and Paul Simon when he was on Howard Stern told the story. I, I imagine it's true. I don't see why he would lie about it sixty years later. Um that uh he said that uh dick clark made him sign over the checks for the appearances everybody who appeared on bandstand had to sign over their checks to dick clark oh my god i believe it (laughs) yeah it's too stupid a story to make up it has to be true yeah well it's also just like all all the like the vestiges of of the old show business where it's just like like we are going, to, yeah, we yeah. are going to drive you into the dirt. If there's an opportunity <laughs> for us to take something from you, we will take it. You know, hundred percent. Yeah. 100%. If we're if we're going back to the early stuff, and again, this is a much more minor complaint, but it's just my own personal thing. Is um one uh, like Paul Simon, like when the, he first talks about like the R and B bands that he was really into, and and the duop groups and stuff like that. He mentions a few of them, like the flamingos or whoever that he likes. Moon glows. The moon glows. Right. He mentions them, but it, but it's like here is an opportunity to get, like the most of the people that really were into that music aren't around anymore, and Mm -hmm. nobody studied it more carefully than Paul Simon. And here is like a like a legitimate musical genius who could sit down and probably, if you prompted him, tell you what made this particular song from that era better and how they harmonized and what made them different and what elements that he and Artie took from different, like, I feel like that would be really interesting. And like, and, and, and and like that, he could do that today. Like you could, you you know, you don't need the, the archival footage of that. Like he, he still has that in the hard drive. Absolutely. So it's like, you know, that's the kind of thing that I was hoping like, all right, you know, we're not going to get that many more opportunities to, for Paul Simon to like lay things out. He doesn't do that many interviews and he's, you know, so that seemed like a little bit of a missed opportunity to me. Stuff like yeah, that, you know, or like the getting into the musical nitty gritty. It's so, there's so little of that for such an accomplished musician in this documentary that maybe cause I'm a musician. So like I would just get off on that, but I just wanted more of that kind of, that kind of stuff. You know, they used a little bit of his interview with or a few places. They used pieces of his interview with Dick Cavett. Right. <clears throat> um, and uh, I've seen um, the longer form version of that interview. I think on on YouTube. I think it's mostly all one inter- uh, one sitting that he's there, and it's it's a lo- you know like a good ten fifteen minutes, and uh, you can still watch it on YouTube. And I recommend it to anyone who's who's even a little bit interested in Paul Simon to what you're saying, David, because <clears throat> excuse me, um, he talks about how he composed Bridge Over Troubled Water, mm, yeah, and he says there was this gospel group and he names the gospel group. And he said they were doing something like with a, you know, a a chord shift or something that, that just rang to him. And he said, so I want, I started with that and he'll play any sister with the guitar and he plays what he meant. And then I'll say, and then from there, I kind of had this other piece. This was like a little bit of Bach and he plays like that. So he goes through exactly. And this is like in 1970. (laughs) <laughs> like this is literally maybe it wasn't even out yet i can't remember but it was really contemporary right at that moment that this song was either was either a big hit maybe it was a big hit i i just can't remember what what, what it was but he's taking you through it and it's like the genius first of all is completely on display because he's he's just white hot in terms of his creativity and he's he's able to articulate and i think this is what sets paul simon apart from so many other artists is he really can tell you what he's thinking he just has a vocabulary that so many other artists don't not because they're not smart just because they it's more instinctive to them maybe but he's thought about it so much and can internalize it and has such a high uh uh, intelligence in terms of communicating that you're just sort of in awe 
of both the physical ability to do what he does because and i'm not i'm 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 the hackiest musician there is um but like the number of chord changes he has or the way how right. hard his finger movements are is just like spellbinding and the fact that he can talk about it and talk right. about how where it came from is unbelievable so anyone who's even a little interested go go check out that interview yeah i mean like this is a guy who like dropped out of law school to pursue music like it's not like he was you know it's a pretty rare story especially in those days when most people in the early days of rock and roll you know like you know had limited amount of education um and you know the time when most musicians that were popular had a college degree came much later and you know and 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 we're kind of in that now, but, um, but, uh, yeah. So, so, I mean, he obviously has that ability to, to, to lay things out. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd forgotten that Artie also like dropped out of like Columbia school of engineering yeah. or something like, like, you know, right. these are two guys that like really took a, took a chance because they could have gone, you know, it, it's, yeah. you know, they're not like Elvis, like it's either this or driving a truck, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> truly, truly. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing <clears throat> is that, and they, they, they kind of talk about it, I guess, a little bit is just that harmony, just that ability to to do this harmony. And it's like, I think in all of popular music, I can't even call it all rock, but like there's the Everlys, there's Simon and Garfunkel, and I would put the Bee Gees in there. Sure. As yeah. just these sort of from another planet kind of harmony um, acts. And it's to me, it's something like that. And that's the kind of thing that I didn't understand until a little bit later. Um, it it is it just it makes it, it knocks me off my chair every time i kind of like really kind of listen for it and and appreciate it it's just it's it's really amazing how how voices can blend like that and they're the only of those examples they're the only ones who aren't brothers yeah right i i do like the um i really like the um anecdote they they share here with um roy halley their producers yeah. or the early producers um, his insight on and how he recorded their voices and how how distinct it was and that how that created their vocal sound, which was basically um, they both sing into one mic and so it blends and the, but then you record it multiple times and then he plays it plays it all on top of each other so it, yeah. it comes yeah. at you. I mean that's something voice. you wouldn't know from anything else. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I never that knew that. I don't know anywhere. if other people had. Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, um, I don't think we have to you know go through every beat of the career because we've kind of already discussed the the collapse of the Simon and Garfunkel thing and, and I feel like the movie kind of strangely skips over a lot of the 70s in a weird way like it's it is weird because we spend a lot of time in the 70s but you right. don't actually get a, a clear understanding of like what was happening in his music career in the 70s for a lot right of, you know? I mean I guess like it would be maybe the Gibney wanted to avoid the thing of being like, and then I did hear there goes Ryman Simon and this was the big hit. And then, you know, so there there's, you know, yeah, trying to avoid that, like having it be a Wikipedia page, but also like, on the other hand, like he's out there making the albums of the year, yeah. knocking them out of the park. And I got the feeling that he wanted to um, hit the, hit the beats that needed to be hit. And if there's a, if there's a, a complaint about it, <clears throat> that, that approach, without trying to touch everything and do the Wikipedia page, there's a complaint about it. It's um, he hit some of them too hard, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, lingered too long on maybe hearts and bones or whatever. The, the one that they hit really hard that it seems like it was deliberate, you know, either from Gibney or Simon or both um, is how addicted to fame you know, and celebrity Simon became outside mm -hmm. of, outside of actual, you know, his it being a, a, a rock star and how present he was, whether it was on SNL or going to award shows or commercials and, and talk shows all the time. And, you know, they, they have an interview. I don't know. Maybe it was from the Dick Cavett show. I don't know where it's from, where he, he openly says that he it becomes you become addicted to it and then it, it, it can eat you. Yeah. And it seems like a, it seems like a real genuine lament about about how preoccupied he with fame he became for a portion. See, I don't, <clears throat> I, I think you're hundred percent right about it, it, w that he was addicted to this fame, but I think that probably glosses over the extent to which he participated in that yes. or courted it. Lets him it off almost, the, it lets him off the hook for that. It for does. Sure. Cause, cause, yeah. cause the sense you get from this film is 
that it was all very it was done to him it was all very yeah. passive yeah uh I'm, I'm not so much i'm the victim but kind of like boy it just hits you and you don't know what to do he he was actively courting it i think for a good portion of maybe that's why we didn't get all the 70s but the, it, he was he was an active participant right yeah, yeah. maybe yeah, as totally. like uh, a grumpy old man or or whatever maybe he just looks back on that with like a little bit of embarrassment like you know yeah, i was right. out there partying yeah. and you know squiring all these actresses around and that's not really right. me that's not the person i want to be remembered as you know i've been married for all these years and i've settled down and blah blah you know i want the the, the music and you know whatever to be the story and, and i understand that um but and i'm not i don't again the reason i was picking on like the getting into the nitty-gritty of the music was because okay you don't want to get into salacious hollywood true stories fine mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. you know i don't know that he's that interesting of a person you know that maybe he's got to have great stories but whatever but the flip so the approaches they take is that this movie is the music of paul simon but so then when they skip over stuff or they they treat it with a little bit of um you know just kind of passing by it's like well then what do we have here you know <laughs> it's you know yeah. it, it's like you, you're trying to have it both ways i guess well the first part in the where that i i was like leaned forward in my seat in excitement was um well i mean it ends up being the section on mother and child reunion um but it begins with you know and you know it's coming when he says you know ska was really popular in jamaica in, in the early 60s and it's like oh, okay we're i know where we're going here this right. is going to be very exciting i'm really interested in hearing paul simon talking about this music the way it influenced him what he liked about it and it's not bad. You do get some of that. You, you you do get the story of him sort of saying, you know, if you want someone's sound, you have to go to them. You you have to go to them and, and get that sound. So he goes to Jamaica. He hooks up with some producers who are putting to some of the music together. He tells these studio musicians that he that he gets in a room what the song is and that he wants it to be a ska song. And they say, well, we don't play ska. We play reggae, which is the first time he's ever heard of heard the word <laughs> reggae. And those people turn out to be toots in the Maytals. <laughs> and like that's like a great rock doc story. I love that yeah. stuff. Yeah. And then and then we and then we, you know, hear Mother and Child Reunion. And like it's good stuff. But I would I would have liked to hear him talk even more about the about his his exposure to ska music and then what he thought about reggae when he w once he was exposed to the fact that there were these two separate things that he wasn't that he wasn't hip to and right. how um you know what that w what what those sort of influences taught him about what he could do and how it would carry through the rest of his career um and w you kind of just leave it earlier than i think i would have liked to um, interesting and so, but, but th that said that, that, you know, of, of all the portions of the movie that I have the least problem with, that might be one of the ones I like the most. And that's also kind of at the, I mean, this happens a few times, but that's kind of the beginning of the issue that he doesn't really address at this point. He does address a little bit later of the credit hogging because yes. like he's the credited composer of mother and child reunion. He's the only songwriter credited, but yeah. the movie tells a story that he came in and they're like, Oh, well, we play reggae. He's never literally never heard of this genre of music. They start playing it. He gets into the groove. He comes up with the lyrics, which are great. And yeah. then it's a Paul Simon. You know, he's getting all the revenue for the rest of time. And, you know, the, the <laughs> Jamaican musicians were, you know, were, were just kind of got, you know, double scale for the session and, yeah. you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And he, well, I he get, in all of these instances, he thinks of it as he's hiring studio musicians to do studio work and he's paying them handsomely for their time. And the, yeah, there do seems to be, you know, legitimate questions about, uh, about whether that's really what they were doing, you know, especially, you know, like we later on in Graceland, they're pretty open about the fact that there were no, there weren't songs. They just jammed together right. sure. until they had something that sounded yeah. like a song. And then he went and wrote to that. Well, that's, that's collaborative. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, you know, sure. it's collaborative, yeah. and, but I mean, but, but he got, well, no, Mother and Child Reunion, just to kind of finish that up, is just, you know, again, um, it's one thing if you go into a studio and you've written the song and then like, yeah, the drummer maybe comes up with the specific drum pattern or something like that. And you could say, OK, what, you know, is that really songwriting or not? That's worthy of discussion. But again, here's a he, it's literally he had never heard of this genre of music 
until he walked into yeah. the studio and they were like, yeah. this is the genre of music we play. It's about to be popular all over the world. And he's like, yeah. great, I wrote that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> again. Yeah, I, I, I think- I'm simplifying it a little bit, but you know. Yeah, no, and <clears throat> I could be a little under the spell, but I, I find the, the narrative around Graceland, self-serving though it is, I don't find fault with his argument though. He didn't, you know, he's listening to this tape that someone gave him. It catches his ear. He says, I want to find these musicians. He finds his way to these musicians, leave out the apartheid and the, and the, right. the that's another, you know, all, debate all the, um, mm-hmm. yeah, all the prohibitions, but he goes down there. He collaborates with these musicians under a very transparent arrangement, right? I'm Paul Simon. I'm coming to you and we're going to work on some things. It's, it was always going to be a Paul Simon whatever, whether it was two songs or an album or whatever, and he paying them paying them handsomely along the way. I don't find anything wrong with with that, and he did he wasn't shy about crediting the fact that these guys all played on it and they were my inspiration and they did all this, and I I think he was consistent that way from the first telling to the last. So I don't I don't find it that um, uh, uh, exploitive. In that regard, at least with regards to Graceland, I'm less familiar with with the reggae stuff in the 70s. But but the Graceland argument to me and, and hearing it again now, all these years later, I don't I don't have a real problem with it. He, he, he seemed to be generous. I don't know. Uh, I mostly I mostly agree. Um, you know, stipulating at the outset, the, the complicated stuff. We're not going to get to the bottom of it here. People have been debating this stuff for 30 years. Yeah. So uh, but. Yeah, I mean, I think it is true that he elevated those styles and people like me have been far more exposed to them than that we ever would have been. Sure. And as much as beneficial as that was for Paul Simon in his career, there are plenty of other musicians who I became turned on to and listened to many times and have gone to concerts for that. Like in another world, would that have happened? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Hard to say, but like. Right. It, it doesn't seem unrelated. Right. And, yeah. and, and that's, and that's in the broadest sense, in the specific sense, he, actual musicians who he brought on stage and put in front of a huge audience and talked up and who, you know, some of whom were already relatively large stars in one specific world and became bigger stars in a bigger world. Like that there was sort of uh, both big picture and small picture. He did absolutely elevate uh, musicians and styles and genres. I don't, and I, I, I think that that wherever, however else you come down on the issue, that has to be part of the narrative. I, I would say. And I think he acted morally and ethically appropriately. Mm-hmm. That, that, I mean, that's my larger point is mm-hmm. he wasn't, he wasn't exploiting these artists. I don't think in any meaningful way, if you want to criticize this or that, or who gets credit on a particular track, I don't know from that, Yeah, yeah. but I, I I'm okay with how he's presented it overall. I can't. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess maybe I'll have the last word or whatever. Um, but you know, from a copyright law perspective, which is my background, uh, you know, I, I'm, we have this regime where a hundred years ago or more, there were composers and they wrote the notes and then they wrote the words. And those were the people that could only get, nobody else could possibly get credit for music because there was no, there was nothing else to get credit for. And recorded music comes in and that regime just continues. So if you're the person who wrote, you know, whatever, Oh, Susanna or whatever, you know what I mean? Like those words, you're the composer, even if, you know, Louis Armstrong comes along and invents jazz or whatever based on playing those changes. And, you know, it's it's just been that way for 100 years. And it ends up, it just so happens to end up so often and has been for a century that the upsh- the person who gets the benefit of that is a Paul Simon <laughs> you know and and right. and is is not the uh it, you know in this case it's a you know uh people in South Africa who were you know living under apartheid i mean you you know you can't really find people who have less negotiating power in this situation um than a Paul Simon and um you know it's not he's not the only example of it there's millions of them and that's it you know we're not going to change that today but um you know, it again. He's acting ethically, I would say, within that regime. Meaning, mm-hmm. um, you know, as long as everybody knows the rules and that's how it is, it's a you know. But it's kind of like a you know, no ethical consumption, <laughs> you know, under a capitalist regime kind of approach. Like we're you know, like uh, I don't know. Yeah. It, it it does strike me the wrong way because um, 
you know, I don't know if there's anybody who, you know, could 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 split the you know split the pot a little bit more uh, with a little with a little bit more fairness. Um, it'll be Paul Simon, and maybe you could say, well, look, a, a, a comparable rock star doesn't even go there, doesn't have any influence of African music, doesn't introduce these people to the world, and they they don't benefit from that either. So I, you know, I could see all the different arguments, but it is. It just so happens that he's the beneficiary because of his particular skill set and his particular position. So, anyway, yeah. whatever. That's yeah. my rant about copyright law that I've been no, holding I think it's all relevant. I think all that's very relevant because it's that's yeah. kind of the issue at at play here, and he brought all that about. Yeah, yeah. And and to turn this back onto the movie, I I do think the movie sort of like, look, they they play a couple clips of him addressing the concerns and you know like sort of press interviews at the time. Um, specifically around around the the cultural blockade, um, and then they they do also have you know some interviews, press interviews where like Hugh Mescala was 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 sort sure. of responding on his behalf. Um, but I think like there's sort of a couple preemptive like uh, guardrails put up around criticism as they're introducing some of these topics. Yeah. Um, the way he you know like the way he slips in that they were getting paid three x scale. For when they came into the studio and the, the way he um sort of uh uh mentions how he found them and 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 what he was doing it, it's sort of like he's he's anticipating the criticism and he's he's trying to to arrange the pieces to make it he's framing go down it. as yeah. smoothly as possible you know no question no question and i guess i'm okay with that yeah i yeah i i mean i think i i am too it's it it it, it it's sort of I mean, you could imagine an unauthorized movie that decides to like make much a uh, much bigger meal out of that whole piece, right. and than than this one does. I love the shit out of the Graceland album, and for all of its <sighs> whatever it it kills, uh, the Graceland holds up. The live performance stuff in this movie, which does go on for a long time, is awesome, and I Fantastic. I have no gripe about that. <sighs> the only complaint I have is where is the Chevy Chase You Can Call Me Al video? Because that was so good. <laughs> Haven't we all seen that enough for a lifetime? I don't know. I, would, I kind of wanted to see like a little clip of Chevy Chase mugging. I just love that. Uh, I eat that up. Probably the last moment that Chevy Chase was good or funny. Um, I'll, I'll, was, I'm with was you that, uh, he had a He had a really solid 10-year run. And then, um, boy. It ended yeah, there. Uh, <laughs> it ended there. Um, but uh, that was probably uh, either the peak or the 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 conclusion but well, i just have to say that the the part where he talks about the the musician telling him they want you to play they want you to play it again, again. <laughs> oh yeah that's so again. good I, that that touches me every time i've it's, you know the couple times i've seen the movie I, i'm just so i'd never seen that before that's not yeah. the kind of thing that you that no. gets talked about and so i was so taken by that each time that it's really such an amazing moment and that second time round when he plays it the second time you're sort of like i mean we've all heard like I said, call me out <laughs> enough right. for, for many lifetimes. And she's like, I don't really want to hear this song again. But when he when he gets into it, you go, No, he's ten times more energized yeah. that second playing. And you go, yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. That's so heartwarming that that, that happened. And it, it. and yeah, the, it's great. The the footage of him performing the Graceland material is it comes not that long in the film after, which we didn't even mention, but the kind of reunion with, so he does the, you know, basically what happens is he's in this movie. uh, It flops the associated album, hearts and bones flops, which I really like that album, but okay. Um, And so then he decides like, well, what am I going to do? I guess I'm going to like sell out all of central park and, 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 and reunite with art. Art Garfunkel and they do this art, you know, and he explains like why, what happened, like, well, if I'm going to bring Art Garfunkel out, then like, basically, if I played before that, then I'm opening for Simon and Garfunkel and I don't want to do that. So it ended up just be, he goes through the logic, which is a little tortured, but okay. So it becomes a, you know, reunion concert. It's obviously the biggest thing of all time. It's great, whatever. Then by some, you know, economic logic, he's, he's, they feel compelled to do a tour. Um, and um and you can just see the footage on the tour like paul does not look like he's thrilled to be 
standing there with his old pal. Uh, All their old problems are uh, not gone right. away. It's, you know, right. singing. Uh, you know, well, he's American, annoyed by how hard he's American dressed, tune, but... whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I will say during this movie, uh, Paul Simon had some really great looks in the seventies and eighties. Man, he he, um, you know. Uh, he, he he does uh, comport himself well in the fashion department, but anyway, he's so also he, done a lot with a bad with a bad uh, head of hair. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. His hair got his hair got better as he got older. <laughs> but it was yeah. the seventies were a rough time. It was, <laughs> he he took the comb over probably as far as any man has ever done. <laughs> like yeah. it's rough. Yeah, uh, but anyway, so um, so yeah, but the delight you get a few scenes later of him performing mm-hmm. this material. Um, as opposed to you know dutifully tromping yes. through the yes the the everything the war horses is he's having it's he's having the most fun I think and he would probably say this I would imagine from how, how much attention it gets it's absolutely the highlight it's monumental yeah. yeah and it should be I mean to me it it it's it, it got so much attention for how great it was it won all those awards but to me the fact that it stands up as a still an amazing album if you listen to it now without any compromise um is testament to to just how how wonderful it is and in the like yeah, it's- in the in the in the making dave feel old uh part of this is so that comes out in the late 80s and 86 okay 86 86, 86. Yeah. and so and then um you know one of my favorite bands, and a band who uh, may have dropped the album of the year, I believe. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> strong they, contender. They, they strong, were on my mind a lot throughout the Strong this contender yes. for album of the year. And I'm going to argue, uh, at some point, uh, possibly the best rock and roll band of the 21st century, uh, would be Vampire Weekend. And and their especially their first album was like heavily influenced by Graceland. It is a great, yes. you know, it's a reboot yes. of Graceland for another generation. Oh, wow. And that... That came out, you know, when that came out, it was like Graceland was some really old shit that happened a long time ago. And th- yeah. and this band, like, like this was my wife and my's favorite band when we first met, and we still, like, we're going to see them this year. And so it's kind of been a big part of my life. And and now it's like their first album is getting getting there, <laughs> like, in terms of being as as far away as Graceland was when that came out, you know, it's still a few yeah. years yet, but it's, it's getting to that point where like a band that I think of as a new band, because I'm an old person, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, that came out in the late two thousands is, you know, for somebody who's maybe 20 and getting into music now, it's like, it's as distant to them as, as Graceland was. So that's, it is, but, but, that but it's sh- timeless to me. Yeah, it, it shows sound the timelessness, old. you know, that, yeah, that the, really a band does. that the, you know is on top of the world and just played at Coachella, you know, two days ago is uh, <laughs> is heavily influenced by this. It, it's you know, spe- I agree. it comes through. Uh, I agree. No, no, here's another uh, thing that could make you or all of us feel old is uh, when Winton is describing the long and storied friendship that he has with Paul Simon that has allowed him to to you know be able to know him so well and to have spoken with him about everything under the sun. Uh, the beginning of their friendship is in 2002, which was, <laughs> yeah. uh, which, was, was which was after, after you saw Paul Simon and Bob Dylan together. <laughs> yeah. That's the old dudes. <laughs> yeah. Three years later. Uh, well, it's, it, it's worth mentioning Rhythm of the Saints is a vastly underrated album. Yeah. It is. I do. It's I don't wonderful, understand why. It wonderful, and it's album. more or less ignored in this time. It gets it's, a little bit of play, but not much. And then the rest of the albums that he's mentioned that I have listened to and mostly did not care for uh <laughs> our it, rhythm of the saints happens it's 1990 and then we wake up and it's 2023 and he's recording yeah. seven songs he's married to edie Brickell. And yeah she's and edie Brickell is great she is delightful she every time she she's is. on the screen it's like paul you you you've overachieved once again because she's uh she, she yes. seems like a hell of a woman she and she does um, although the the performance with them the two of them singing together yeah it's rough that might be the longest musical performance in the movie. That's how you know it's. Yeah, that might be longer than anything that happens in the, the Zimbabwe concert. Maybe. Yeah, it's not. I mean, she has great pipes. It just doesn't work yeah, with his. T- totally. It's not. It's not a good fit. Um, it's gratuitous. And it does not need to. Be it just there. made me kind of want to dig back into her catalog because I knew, like, you me know, yeah. I knew that one song. But that's basically it. And, and yeah, and, and I but, always liked that song. I I, yeah. I, 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 I did not know that sh- that the person who sang that song was married to Paul. But Simon. I couldn't I tell you that. if Edie Bacall since then has released 10 albums or one album or none or 20. I you know, I have no I have yeah. no sense of it and um but she should not be just considered Paul Simon's wife who had a one hit 
wonder because she, I mean, she seems like a, a, a force. Also, of like Paul Simon's relationship with SNL was literally that like he could just start manning a camera during <laughs> during Edie Brickell's performance. If he has the hops for the singer, <laughs> the sing, like one of the perks. Like, yeah, like, yeah. Is that Jeez. still I mean, good thing? Is that still good thing? Chippy wasn't behind that camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that still a policy? Like, yeah. you know, if Taylor Swift is performing, does Paul Simon get to that? Paul's got keys to the kingdom. She's, yeah, she's like, she's just singing. She's like, I'm I'm just distracted. Is Paul Simon behind the camera over there? I, I'm having a hard I time focusing. I can't imagine there's a lot of artists that would have been that distracted. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, it's a little bit of a um, funny story, but okay. It's a meet cute. Yeah. And um, yeah, and he briefly exactly. addresses like, well, we can't get together because of our vast age difference. And then cut to you know, whatever, yeah. however many years later, they're we're, still together. We're Good for them. Yeah. Uh, a yeah. couple things I have to mention. The fingernails on his right hand. Dude, very long. Out. Yeah. Creep me out. I, I get long. your, f- you're married to that guitar. <laughs> it's your, it, it's what helps you finger pick. I get it. it creeps me out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, 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 wrote, I wrote a note down too. the very long fingernails. <laughs> he's got a, he's got serious guitar player <laughs> really fingernails. Right. That's a thing. Uh, yeah. I mean, if Edie can deal with that on the first day. <laughs> yeah. I think you're, you know, that's the big okay. hump to get over. We danced around Wynton Marsalis. I want to get back to that because that is another, <laughs> he's another major character in this film. And yeah, he's like um, one of the, one of the main characters for sure. And yeah. he, apparently he's there to provide wisdom and insight. And all yeah, he does like, is, uh, all he does is pump up Paul. Just tells him how great he is. How, d- don't, don't thank me. We're like, leave we the are, mistakes we, in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I mean, so like, I like Wynton Marsalis. Who, who doesn't? Who doesn't like Winmarsons? Talented right? guy. Like talented. Perfectly play the horn. Fair. Yeah. Nice guy. Um, <laughs> can play the horn. Play the, the hell out of a horn. Play the hell out of a horn. The and he's obviously very smart. So I'm not saying he's not smart enough to speak like this off the cuff. I'm saying that specifically, the things he says in response to Gibney asking him, "What type of things do you guys talk about?" <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Sounds pre-written, and it doesn't uh, not pre-written like premeditated. He says it. The way somebody reads a list of things, I I, I don't believe that that was off the cuff. I don't believe that that was. Did off you the write cuff. this list down because I wanted to and I didn't <laughs> think to do it? It's a lot of fortune cookie wisdom. The yeah. whole yeah, yeah. And, I, and I liked it. And I I like the parts that were not, you know, that kind of Q and A. I like the parts where he is interacting a little more, you know, uh, 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 responsibly with with Paul. But uh, yeah, uneven on that note for sure. Like, there's it's not <laughs> like Paul. Is like, all right, I trust you. You've got great ears. You're a great musician. Like, you're a person on my caliber uh, as a composer. Um, and he plays what something am, for What am I missing? Yeah. And he plays something for it. And he's like, that one sucks, Paul. Don't play. Like, that would be great. <laughs> you know, or he's like, like, like Lars's dad. Yeah. <laughs> delete or, that. <laughs> delete that. That would be awesome. Or, you know, but yeah, even if he had just been like, you know what? I think that really needs a bridge or. Why don't you yeah. do go to the A minor there or something, you know, like uh, presumably they have these conversations, but it's not on camera. And, and if it's just like he's his buddy and he wants to hang out and that's cool, that's fine. But it, it's it's built up to be something that doesn't deliver. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> it's as if his presence was meant to just kind of carry the carry the day. Yeah, right. You know? I do like the the one. uh the one piece of Paul wisdom that comes about through that whole section is uh, the ear goes to the irritant. Mm, right. That's a good one. That's good. Yeah. Uh, That's I'll use good. that the next time I, I dislike something I'm hearing at a concert. <laughs> <laughs> use, it, use it in an everyday meeting. Yeah. You know, Jane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The ear goes to the irritant. What the fuck are you saying? Or if people are complaining about the Carl Denson show that where yeah. you, where <laughs> yeah. you're like, oh, but you know, the ear goes to the irritant. Oh yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> All right, I, I, guess I'll, I, ha- I have around. to. I have to mention what uh, just about the only song that's played, I think, in its entirety. "Sound of Silence" probably being the other one mm-hmm. <clears throat> is my favorite Paul Simon song, which is an American tune. Yeah, and I I was th- waiting for Bernie song, Sanders to show up. <laughs> I know it, it, but that does it for me every time. Yeah, that song. Yes, you know, it was written in the Watergate era and. It got a lot of play during the pandemic. He uh-huh. did a lot of versions of that. He would come on, I don't know if it was Letterman or Conan or whoever, and just play that, you know, when there's like no audience. It's just very moving. But the words, I mean, that's, to me, that's like a, 
I don't know. That's the part where it's sort of like I'm stopped in my tracks by just how fucking genius a lyricist can be and and songwriter can be. Because to me, that's I, I don't know. There's a there's a timeless quality about that song, and um, the lyrics are going to be are going to remain true for a hundred years, as far as I'm concerned, or longer. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, the guy wrote a lot of great songs, <laughs> so no, um, no doubt about it. I mean, and it, 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 the movie doesn't even like, you know, there's like, I don't think Kodachrome shows up in the movie, you know, like yeah. something that would have been the, the highlight of another rock doc, you know, in terms of a great song doesn't even bear mentioning. And, yeah. um, you yeah. know, so, I mean, that again, that's the, I feel like there's just like a lot of, you know. Kodachrome, I think, was one of the first like Paul Simon solo songs that I fell in love with, which was uh, or one of the Paul Simon songs I fell in love with, which I think was through Lauren Michaels uh, because of its use as a montage in the film adaptation of Coneheads. <laughs> right. Why wasn't that mentioned in this movie? Come on. They're leaving out all the good stuff. Other, other great moments in his career left on the cutting room. Floor. But no, I, I He's known for swing, The I, Graduate and but, Coneheads in terms of yeah. his cinematic, you know. Uh, I wanted to swing around to that because to me, you know, the, the, the high and low points of the film and the structure and yeah, all yeah. the stuff that, uh, to me, he's worth the the God treatment that he gets here to me, all of it. Like there needed to be an authorized or unauthorized, but there needed to be a three and a half hour retrospective of Paul Simon. In my opinion, as a fan, because there's, there's so few, yeah. I think that deserve. I, I agree that he's a deserving subject. I, I, I think it, it's totally, totally correct. There's, there is a uh, episode of the PBS masters um, about Paul Simon. Um, oh. I don't know. American I, I haven't Masters. Watched. I American Masters. Yeah, PBS American Masters. And all the other Masters are not as good those, as the from American the Masters. Er, we all early nineties. So I, I, you know, I'd be interested in that. That would be an interesting one. Too. Already's in it for like nine minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just that I, I think he is deserving because I love his music, and um, you know, I, I just feel like you know what I feel like I want to, you know. Like, I would want a Paul Simon documentary that I could, you know, my kid is seven, so he's a little young for this. But, you know, in a few years, sit him down and be like, this is one of the great songwriters and composers. And, and, and you know, you'll hear his songs your whole life. And and, and there's a reason for that. And I, I just don't know that I could be like, OK, so for the next three hours, we're going to watch this. And a lot of it, you well, know, like whenever you see the barn, fast forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If there was a better, you know, or, or slightly different take, I would feel uh more comfortable recommending it to the uh you know future uh you know little jewish boys or whatever <laughs> so i don't know <laughs> yeah no i i i actually think that, that um to answer your point about american tune like i would uh, that that section comes too late and is like not as central in the story of how great he is uh, as told in this movie it's like yeah like that might be the defining song of that decade you know <laughs> And, and maybe this decade. And yeah, right. <laughs> and sure. like, and, and it, it's used well here. It's used effectively when it is. Well, that's what I'm saying. They played it end yeah, to end, yeah, which kind of yeah. gives it that weight. Right. But I agree. It's a little out at sea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, than it than it ought to be. But yeah. Good stuff. Ah uh, well, um, I think we've um shared our uh, our pros and cons about this one, and uh, you know, um. I don't know. I, 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 we could go on, but I think we kind of covered it. Anything we missed that uh, needs to be uh, w- that we would be remiss in, in not mentioning about this film? I think, I think that about covers it. I'm gonna see if is there a, a full cut of that Zimbabwe concert. I might have to. That would be oh. that would be tight. Uh, that is would I'd rather spend three hours on that, honestly. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And when he when he played the second. Um, uh central park concert mm-hmm. which was after rhythm of the saints uh th- there was a whole big production this time around because obviously everyone you know it's paul simon back in central park and uh dennis miller i think was the mc <laughs> for the broadcast <laughs> that is so like 1990 it was perfect yeah and he said one of these lines that i just always think i always think is great and it's it's not that great a line but dennis miller delivering it was just perfect he goes uh, on stage, you're going to see 30 of the most amazing <clears throat> musicians from around the world, 30 musicians 
it's the 30 positions that um, it took to replace Artie. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. He had, he had a few good ones, Dennis Miller. Uh, another one who oh, yeah. probably I would say fell off a little bit. <laughs> but, Agreed. But, uh, you know, he had his moments. <laughs> That's right. That's right. All right. Um, well, uh, you know, Dan, thanks again. I don't. Uh, Thank you, you guys. Know, we, don't, we don't always have an elegant way to wrap these up, but. Um, you know, listen to Paul Simon's music. Perhaps watch the film if you've got MGM Plus and um, you've run out of all the content on there. No, it's, it, no, the, the film has its high points. It has its virtues, but uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big the, meal. Yeah, the the bottom line can only go so low when you're still dealing with Paul Simon's music. Right. Yeah, you know. Well done. Well said. Exactly. Right, absolutely. We've certainly seen shittier rock docs on this yeah, podcast. And <laughs> talked about them at great length. So you know, yeah. that's fine. Um. All, all right. Good. Uh, well, Dan, uh, people, Thanks, fellas. people who like, uh, hearing your voice can sometimes hear you on, the uh, they coined it a podcast about Mad Men that, uh, hopefully we'll be back soon. And, um, that's, uh, very good. Anything else, wherever, uh, po- wherever podcasts are sold, uh, anything else you, uh, want to shout out plug or uh, praise or, you know, whatever. I don't know. No, we're all good. Enjoy the doc, people. (laughs) Give it, give it a whirl. All right. Uh, Well, thanks for listening to Rock Docs again. Treble Media, TrebleZine.com. Support their Patreon. They're good people. And um, yeah, thanks uh, for listening. I've never wanted to be anything other than a singer and a songwriter. I'm Graceland. Graceland. Artie, that was a good friendship. We thought we should express what our generation felt. We are home. I had a dream that said, you're working on an album called Seven Songs. I want to go and follow the music, but you never know what you're going to find along the way. learn is that when you find a thing that produces a feeling of peace or joy try and hold on to it it's like bliss that's music for me thank you so much